<laughs> awesome. You're doing good. Uh, my name is John. I'm the pastor of student ministry here at Grace Point Church, which means that I have the awesome privilege of partnering with parents in the discipleship of their children. Um, I heard a statistic the other day that said that that 80% of people who come to faith in Jesus do so before the age of 18. So as you can imagine, student ministry is important, and I'm excited to be a part of the team here. Uh, this morning, we're going to continue our fourth out of five series through this letter of 1 Corinthians entitled, Better Together. And what we've seen so far is that, that each of us has been given these gifts in order to build each other up, to build up the church. You see, you and I, we are better together. However... What we're going to see from today's text is that there's one crucial element, and if we miss it, if we move on without it, we not only miss the point, but we might as well not even show up. If you have a Bible, would you open it or, or turn it on to 1 Corinthians chapter 13? I just want to read a couple of verses, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4. Are you there? All right says this, love is patient and kind, love does not envy or boast, it's not arrogant or rude, it does not insist on its own way, it's not irritable or resentful, it does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never ends. A beautiful passage of scripture, and this morning I'm going to be speaking from the topic of life and love redefined. Life and love redefined. And my goal is to help make sense of this text, both practically and relationally, especially in regards to what the Apostle Paul writes in verse 2, where he says, if I have not love, I am nothing. What in the world does it mean to be nothing without love, and what kind of love do I need if I want to be something? So tell me, in life, in relationship, who or what defines you? What is your main priority? What is our main priority as a church? What should be our defining characteristic? What should we be known for? Now, before we dive into this text, would you join me for a moment in prayer? God, you are so, so good. You're so big and sovereign and powerful. You create all things, yet you love us individually and intimately. I pray, Lord, that as we continue in this letter of 1 Corinthians, that you would continue to open up our hearts, our ears, to a greater understanding of your love for us, that we have a greater understanding of the gospel. God, I pray, Lord, that you would save people in here, that you would give them the gift of faith. I pray, Lord, that we would leave here with a greater understanding of your love, and as a result, that we would love others profoundly. Lord, I pray that as I speak, that the meditations of my heart and the words of my mouth would be pleasing to you, for you are my rock and you are my redeemer. God, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if you've noticed or not, but mirrors, mirrors are extremely important, especially if you're a guy that has facial hair, beard, mustache of some kind. You see, the other day, um, I was eating a delicious Einstein bagel with cream cheese. <laughs> I love Einstein bagels. But I was, like most Americans, in a rush on my way to work, eating while I drove. And well, a, a, a tiny portion, actually a gigantic portion of cream cheese, decided to take up residence inside my mustache. And it was several hours. I mean, several hours before I noticed it was there. Now, before you question my personal hygiene, I think the people to blame are the ones who call themselves my friends. As I <laughs> walked around, talked to people, sat in meetings, and counseled with this disgusting clump of bright white cream cheese hanging from my lip. <laughs> but either way, the fact is I really could have used a mirror a lot sooner. Mirrors, well, mirrors are important. And I think our text, I believe, was written as, as a sort of spiritual mirror to its readers. See, this passage is famous. It's an extremely popular portion of Scripture. You might have heard it spoken at a wedding. Maybe you've seen it written on coffee mugs or hanging on a piece of artwork in Hobby Lobby. And as a result of popularity, many people think that this passage is simply a beautiful, poetic definition of love. I mean, it makes sense with phrases like, love never ends. 
and love endures all things. I mean, those are some of the most beautiful phrases that the human heart can hear. They speak directly to our longing. They speak directly to our brokenness within all of us. And for the most part, I think humanity thinks that love is a good thing. When the Beatles sang the song, all you need is love, love, love is all you need. I think people might have felt slightly suspicious, but they still sang along. Because there's at least a part of every human heart that thinks, you know what, there might be some truth to that. We want it to be true, and in a way, we kind of need this to be true. I mean, there's plenty of things that you and I can live without, but love, love is not one of them. And unfortunately, these words we've seen taken out of context, and as a result, they've become almost like white noise, especially to those of us who have been in church for a while. This might have been the hundredth time that you've heard 1 Corinthians referenced, and you're thinking, yep, love never ends, got it, let's move on. And you might be tempted not to look into this spiritual mirror this morning, and if that's you, don't disappear. The reality is Paul wrote this passage to a a church in the city of Corinth in order to get this message to people who, like you and like me, have heard it a hundred times, over and over. Now, like many of us, the people in this church in the city of Corinth had the religious stuff down. They prayed, they sang, they confessed their sins, they took communion, they heard a sermon, they even shared meals together. But in their coming and in their going and all their church and religious activity, in spite of all the sermons that they heard on love, they struggled to keep love. They failed to keep love at the center of their lives. The truth is they had gotten themselves in some arguments about who was the best, who was the smartest, who was the most spiritual, who had the greatest spiritual gift. They argued and debated about who was the most eloquent, who gave the most money, who did the most community service. And so what we find in chapter 13 is Paul is writing to this group of people and he's essentially asking the question, what in the world is going on over there? I'm hearing rumors and stories about how you're not living and loving well. You see, reports were getting back to Paul that people were competing, that people were comparing. And so what's really happening here is that these people are being called out. Chapter 13 is a sort of rebuke. It serves as a mirror to point out the areas in in their relationships, in their life, in which they weren't and that we aren't living and loving like Jesus. And Paul, he begins in chapter 12 in the second half of, of verse 31, and he essentially says this, I know you love excellence. I know you value perfection, but let me show you a more perfect way. Let me show you a more excellent way, the way of love. Now, here's the problem at least for us. I think that when we hear this word love, our minds are flooded by our own definitions of what love is, definitions that have been shaped by our society and culture from music and movies and literature. Love is a word that's used flippantly and used for everything. For example, I love mint chocolate chip ice cream, and I also love baseball, but I love my wife and my kids, and if I love my wife in the same way I love baseball, I'm going to have some problems especially since I'm a Padres fan. (laughs) Obviously, love has different values and different definitions, and it can be confusing. Good thing for you and good thing for me, Paul helps us in our text by defining what love is. But before he does, he takes a second. He says, I want you to imagine a life without love. You see, in the first three verses of 1 Corinthians 13, Paul lays out three elements, three elements that will be important for us to keep in mind throughout this time that we have together. You see, Paul is focusing on what a Christian says, what a Christian knows, what a Christian does, what we say, what we know, and what we do. So tell me, if you were to determine if the Holy Spirit was active or involved in a church, how would you go about doing that? What measurements would you use? How would you discern this? What piece of evidence would be the most important? Would you analyze their worship? Would you analyze their music and their liturgy? Would you ask, is it passionate enough, emotional enough? Is it heartfelt enough? Do they lift their hands? Are their songs doctrinally and theologically correct? Are they emotional when they sing and when they pray? Are their prayers eloquent? Are they they using big theological words? Tell me, are those the measurements? Are those the marks of the Holy Spirit? Or do you look at their library? 
Do they have all the right books by all the right authors? Do they quote all of the right people? Or would you look at their spiritual gifts? Do they prophesy? Do they speak in tongues? Do they possess incredible knowledge? Do they have amazing faith even in the midst of horrible circumstances? Are these the signs? Are these the measurements of a gospel community? Are these the characteristics and the gifts that are crucial in our goal to make disciples of Jesus that live in community for the community? Well, Paul here, he would say, no. And all of these things were happening in Corinth. And understand, Paul doesn't belittle them. He doesn't prohibit them. In fact, he says that these things should be happening more and more and more. But he reminds us of something that should be more fundamental and center of the life of a follower of Jesus in a gospel community. And really, this is what we as a church should be defined by. So, what is it? Paul says, here is the essential truth. Here is the important sign of the Spirit's work in a heart and in a life and in a community. He says, friends, your life, your community should be defined by love. You see, if Paul was tasked with assessing whether or not the Holy Spirit was at work in a person or in a community, the one thing he would look for, the one thing he would ask is this. Is that life, is that community characterized by love? Are they saturated with it? Are they riddled with it? Or is it a community or a life that's infused by a deep love for God and a profound love for people? And this morning, I want to ask you the same thing. Is your life characterized by a deep love for God and a profound love for people? Grace Point, as a community, are we defined by a deep love for God and a profound love for people? Or, like the Corinthians, have we missed the point? See, Paul here is emphatically declaring that a life of love is not simply icing on a cake. A life of love is not some additional piece that we add on to our life. Love is the most essential and indisputable mark of a follower of Jesus. Church, this is our litmus test. And I have to imagine that as Paul wrote this, that the words of Jesus were ringing in the back of his ears, especially the words of Jesus from John chapter 13, verse 35, where Jesus says, by this, all people will know that they are my disciples, if you have what? Love for one another. Love is supreme. Grace point, how are we doing? Let's look back at chapter 13, verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. In other words, if a person uses their gift and they serve others with their gift, even if they see fruit from their gift, Paul says it doesn't mean anything. It really doesn't amount to anything, amounts to nothing if it doesn't stem from this profound love for God and this deep and profound love for others. It doesn't matter how brilliant you are, how theologically and doctrinally correct you are. It doesn't matter how skilled you are, how smart, how persuasive, how powerful. It doesn't matter how devoted you are. If you do not possess love, all of your productivity, all of your success, effectiveness and efficiency, all of your giftedness means nothing. In other words, your gift, no matter how effective, becomes a hindrance. It almost becomes an annoyance when it's without love. D.A. Carson says this, You remain spiritually bankrupt, a spiritual nothing, if love does not characterize your exercise of whatever grace gift God has assigned you. Paul continues on here. And he, and he gives us a definition now. All right, if this is what your, love needs, your life needs to be defined by, well, what is it? And he defines it in verse 4, and it's here that Paul provides for us a perspective on love that is both beautiful and striking, but at the same time a little bit overwhelming and seemingly beyond human experience and ability. Look at verse 4. Paul here, he's holding out the mirror now. He's holding out the mirror, and he says this, love is patient and kind. In other words, love waits for others. Love refuses to rush. Love refuses to be judgmental. Love refuses to criticize. He says love is kind. And by kind, he's talking about a kindness that is active. 
in its care for people, a kindness that is proactive in being compassionate and generous and caring for others. Paul continues and he says, love does not envy, love does not boast. You see, love is not defined by competition or rivalry. Love is not trying to figure out if it stacks up against the competition. It's not always comparing and contrasting itself against others. Paul says, love is not arrogant. In verse five, he says, it's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way, but rather, love considers others. Seek someone else's good over its own. Love is not harsh. Love is not impolite. It's not improper. It doesn't demand, but rather, it seeks to be second. It doesn't control. Love doesn't coerce, but rather asks, how can my gift help others? He says it's not irritable or resentful. It doesn't explode into a different defensive behavior It's not looking for an opportunity to vent because it didn't get its own way. Verse 6, he says, It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love loves to look for opportunities to encourage and to build up. And finally, in verse 7, he says, Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. He's holding up this mirror and he's punching us in the gut at the same time. If you didn't catch on, in verse 4, Paul is essentially saying, look, you're not being patient. (laughs) You're not being kind. The truth is you're rude and you're arrogant. You're insisting on your own way. You're irritable and resentful with one another. You're holding grudges. You're quick to spread gossip. You're quick to break relationships with each other. Let's just be honest for a second. How quick are we to change community groups or leave community groups or leave a church because of a broken relationship? Look at how Paul describes this in verse 11. He says, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up my childish ways. In other words, toddlers are impatient. Toddlers are rude. Toddlers envy and toddlers boast. Toddlers insist and demand on their own way. As you can tell, I've got three. (laughs) Toddlers are irritable and resentful. Paul is saying, look, you guys are being a bunch of toddlers. Paul's asking the church in Corinth, and he's asking us, Grace Point, to look at how we're really loving, to look at how we're really living. Take a moment and reflect on your life. How are we measuring up? I don't know about you, but when I look at my own life, And I read through this list, I have to be honest, I'm a bit overwhelmed. I read this, love is patient and kind, it doesn't envy or boast, it's not arrogant or rude, it doesn't insist on its own way, it's not irritable or resentful, it does not rejoice at wrongdoings, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. I read through these 15 attributes of what love is, and I don't know about you, but I feel like taking a nap. What is Paul saying here? Well, logically, Paul is saying that we need to be patient. We need to be kind. We shouldn't envy. We shouldn't boast. We shouldn't be prideful. We shouldn't be rude. We shouldn't insist on our own way. We should stop being irritable and resentful, just bear all things all the time, hope in all things all the time, endure all things all the time. That's all he's asking us to do. Come on, Grace Point. The message today is this. Just be perfect. (laughs) Endure all things. Bear all things. And if we're not careful, we can end a message like this and a gathering like this, and a passage like this with an amen, a good luck, a pat on the back, see you next week. And to be honest, most of us are looking at this list and looking at, these, at each other like, uh, there's no way I can do this. The reality is, it's easy, it's easy to walk away with this with a list of things that we need to work on. But I don't think that's the main point here. And it's a good thing. Because... We're all extremely far away from living a life like this. None of us have the ability to love like this. So what is the point that Paul is trying to make here? Well, to understand Paul's point, I think we first have to have an understanding that Paul originally wrote this letter in the Greek language. And in the Greek language, there are four words for what in the English language is one word, love. You see, our English word love covers a wide variety, a a giant spectrum of human experience in which the Greek language divided into four categories. We see two of them in the New Testament. The first one is this word friendship or, or phileo in Greek. This word springs from the companionship of two people with, who have an affection for each other. It's respect for each other. It's this pursuit of a common goal. 
or interest. The second word we see in the New Testament is this word agape. Everyone say agape. Agape. Agape is a divine love. It's a love that can only come from God. Agape is relentless, unconditional. It's a love that needs no reciprocation. It just loves. It needs no reserves. Agape love is supernatural. Agape love is divine. This is the word that Paul is describing and using in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now, most of us, we're very familiar with phileo love or, or brotherly love, common courtesy, holding the door open for somebody. It's this love that you have for your family and your friends. And it's important to note this, that even people who do not know Jesus, they understand phileo love. There's commercials that depict human kindness, political and social campaigns that tell us that the answer is just to be more accepting and involved. And there's that song again from the Beatles, All We Need Is Love. And the truth is that they're on the right track. They're moving in the right direction. But if phileo love was the answer, then we wouldn't need Jesus, would we? We could save the world with our ability to set goals and to motivate. But the reality is we're still broken. We're still in need. We're still lost. See, the only real answer is found in agape. The only real answer is found in Jesus. And like us, the Corinthian church was struggling to live out phileo love. And Paul says, hey, you guys actually need to live out agape love. It's impossible. This is daunting. It's overwhelming. It's like coming to me and saying, you know what, John, you need to you need to beat LeBron James at a one-on-one basketball game. It's not going to happen because he has not returned my calls or my texts, no matter how strong I am. <laughs> but they say it's impossible. They say it's impossible. It doesn't matter how hard we try or how bad we want to love like this. In our own strength, it's impossible. I might as well expect my five-month-old daughter to do algebra before she talks. It's not going to happen. This beautiful thing that everyone longs for, perhaps more than anything in the world, not only looks to be out of reach, but looks to be impossible. I mean, we're struggling to live out conditional love well. How in the world are we going to live out unconditional love? And he doesn't stop here. Like, he continues. Not only are we supposed to love like this, but he, in, in verse 8, he continues to talk about this, and he begins by describing love's permanency. So not only are you supposed to love like this, but you're supposed to love like this all the time, without end. Look at verse 8. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they're going to pass away. As for tongues, they'll cease. As for knowledge, it's going to pass away. For we know in part and we'll prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. What in the world is he talking about here? Well, I think he's asking us, as you live these fast-paced lives, as you strive for effectiveness, and as you strive for efficiency, what is it all for? Let's say you get everything you want, and you achieve everything you're working for. What happens when it's all done? What happens at the end of your life? What are people going to say about you when it's all said and done? See, Paul is not dumb. I think he not only recognizes his own limitations, but the limitations of humanity. Everything we know, everything we say, everything we'll do in this life is going to pass away. All of our gifts, our skills, our actions, even our spiritual insights are partial and perishable. See, death is hot on our trails, and there's nothing we can say or know or do that will help us escape it. But love, well, verse 8 says that love never ends. Love is not perishable. Love is, not uns love, love is unspoilable. Love is death-proof. Love fills life with permanent significance. However, if you and I were to be honest about our human condition and our fickleness, we know that we've failed at this. We know that we failed to love unconditionally. We failed to love without reciprocation, without conditions. We know we are fickle. We know our loyalties shift and our emotions are ever-changing. I mean, this list, which just sounded so beautiful at that wedding... <laughs> beautiful and poetic is now a source of stress when you realize, wait a second, you're asking me to do what? I failed at that in my drive to church this morning. And I'm reminded of what Paul writes in Romans 7 verse 15. He says, for I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Can anyone else relate to that? 
I can. It's called human nature. This is the human condition. I want, I, what I want to do, I say I'll do, and I don't actually follow through with it. And what I don't want to do is what I actually end up doing. When we read passages like this about our human nature and condition, and then we read passages like 1 Corinthians 13 about the definition and expectation of love, we have to ask ourselves, what is the expectation? Is, really, is Paul really telling us what we're supposed to and what we're expected to do? That we're supposed to and expected to live out agape love? Really? Yeah, he is. It's exactly what he's telling us. And if you are where I'm at, this despair and realization and understanding that we cannot find this love within ourselves or in others is exactly the point. See, I believe what Paul's doing in this text is what we see Jesus doing in many of his teachings, and that's to get us to the end of ourselves, to bring us to the end of our rope, to realize that we have limits, to realize that, that we have boundaries, to realize that we are not God, to realize that without God we are empty, to recognize within us the depths of transformation that needs to take place. See, the premise of this passage is that we would experience this transformation, that we would encounter agape love in the person of Jesus. Because without the love of Jesus, all of this would be pointless. We have no reason to be here today. The whole purpose of this text is, is the reality that, that we need a Savior and, and we are not Him. We need a hero to rescue us from the darkness and despair in order for us to be successful not only in our marriages and our parenting and our singleness, but in every area of life. In order for us to be better together, we have to recognize our need for a savior. You see, the error of the love that's been defined by society and culture, the error of love that we have bought into is that we have attempted to find this love within ourselves. We have viewed as love as something as, as we do, a muscle that, that we exercise, an emotion that we feel, an experience that we have. And the cost of locating this love within ourselves is that we have limited it and we've given it an expiration date. If love is to be the love that Paul is describing in our text, then it necessarily has to come from outside of us. You see, love happens to us. Love is not the words we say, it's not the feelings we feel, it's not the, the, the deeds that we do, it's far bigger than all of this. It's this only this kind of love that Paul is talking about that remains. It's only this kind of love that can redefine our lives and our community. So we have to come to the understanding this, that if this love must be from outside of us to remain, then God is the only one fit for the bill. He is the only one fit for the role of love. God is the only one who can love with a love that never ends. Listen to me. You see, love says this. I hear you. I understand you. You are not noise. Love says, I know you fully. Every mistake, every mishap, I know your shame, I know your fear, and despite what you've done and despite where you've been, I love you with a love that's never going to end. I love you with a love that needs no reciprocation. I love you with a love that you cannot earn. Love says you are not nothing, you are valuable, you are worth giving everything I have. Love says I will die for you. Friends, this is exactly what we find in the good news of Jesus. You see, Jesus looks at all your issues. He looks at your lovelessness, he sees every mistake, he sees every mishap, and he doesn't simply say, yeah, I will die for you. He says, I did die for you. It's already done. I became nothing so that you would know that you are not nothing. In this way, God who is love, he fills life with the necessary love and meaning we crave. And through his spirit living in us, he empowers us to love God deeply and to love others profoundly. Now you might be thinking, but John, what am I supposed to do with the lack of love that is still evident in my life? What am I supposed to do with all this impatience and kindness and envy? What do I do with the self-insistence? I mean, I was irritable this morning and resentful. What do I do? It's apparent that I have limits on my love, isn't it? Isn't it apparent that we have limits on our love? I mean, I even struggle at times to love my spouse well. I struggle at times to love my kids well. And if you were to be really honest, there's times in which we struggle to love God well. And here's what we do. 
in order for us to love God deeply and others profoundly, rather than muster up this love within us, we need to hear and we need to rest in what Jesus has accomplished on our behalf. We need to hear and rest in in what God's love has done for us. So look back at verse 4. This is God's attitude towards you. This is God's posture towards you. In all of your brokenness, in all of your mess, in all of your shame and your fear, God says, I'm patient. Even when you sin, God is kind to us and his kindness leads us to repentance. God does not envy or boast. God is not arrogant or rude. He is not harsh or controlling. God is not irritable. In his love, he does not resent, but rather he bears us on his shoulders. And he endures, he endures us in all of our unbearableness. He won't back down, he won't wear out, he promises that he's never gonna leave you nor forsake you. God will never walk out on you. His love has no expiration date, his love has no limits. You see, in Jesus, the creator of love put skin and bone on and lived a perfect life, a life that you and I were created to live but failed to do so. And in what looked like the greatest tragedy and loss of all time, a loss that included his own death, Jesus accomplished the ultimate victory. You see, the resurrection of Jesus signed and sealed his defeat of sin and death. This is how we know that love will never end. Because his love has already defeated sin. His love has already defeated death. Loved, faced, death, and love won. And now God says this, Love is not dependent upon you. (laughs) Love is dependent upon my death. And now you get to live and love because I lived in love and died in love for you. And finally, look back at verse 12. I'm almost done. Thank you for the way you guys have been listening. (laughs) Paul finishes these thoughts and he says this. Verse 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly. Back then, mirrors were simply polished metal, and so there wasn't the best reflection. And so he's saying, he's comparing this dim view of love to the love that we see kind of through us and and what we've been talking about here. But he says, there's going to be a moment when I stand face to face before Jesus. And if you're familiar with 1 John chapter 3, it says, we don't know Jesus fully now, but one day when we stand before him, we're going to become like him. Man, I look forward to that day. And he says, now I know in part then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. In verse 13, he says, So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three things, but the greatest of these is love. I do not think that it's a coincidence that love is the last word in this chapter. Because love is the last word from the cross. He says we have these things, faith, hope, and love. Which one lasts? Which one endures? Which one never ends? Love. Love is eternal. You see, God has no need for hope. God has no need for for faith. He has no need for them. But he is love, and love never ends. Love is the only thing that lasts. Love is eternal, and the reality is this. Chapter 13 is essentially a biography of Jesus. And the love of Jesus is an eternal love. Now hear me. If you did not hear anything I said this morning, please hear this. Jesus will never stop loving you. He'll never stop. He'll never stop loving you. So this morning, would you allow God's love to fill your life? And as you rest in his love, church, let's be conduits of his love to each other and to North Las Vegas as we strive to make disciples of Jesus that live in community for the community. Let's pray.